There we go. Now we're recording. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our presentation today about OER and inclusive access. Um, my name is Kelly Broughton, and I am the Assistant Dean for Research and Education in the University Libraries. And my colleague is... Hi, I'm Esti Major Rohr, and I'm managing the Academic Technology Team and Service within OIT. Um, so today we're going to focus on reviewing a couple of different options for selecting your course materials that are supported here on campus. Um, I would encourage you to use the chat or unmute yourself if you have questions or anything to add along the way. This will be relatively casual um, and we hope to have plenty of time at the end for additional conversations or questions. Oh, there we are. There's SDNI with our contact information. Okay, so just to start off a little bit of information about why you might want to care about the cost of course materials for your students. Um, here are some bullets and some statistics from two very recent uh, large surveys of students. The first two come from the National Association of College Stores, recent 1920 survey of students. Um, and the second two come from a research, second edition of a research project that was published by USPRRGs. Um, and uh, something that we probably all know that, right, the cost of textbooks have risen much higher than the rate of inflation. Uh, much like the rest of the costs of higher education, um, and that this has serious implications to our students. So 28% of students in the NAICS survey said they, they just didn't get one of their required pieces of materials, either a textbook or a code. 67% um, said that they were going to wait to find out if the listed material was really needed. Um, in the PERG survey, 25% of students reported working extra hours to cover the cost of their course materials. 19% chose classes based on course material costs. That is, they selected which section or what course they were going to enroll in based on what was published as the cost of the course materials. Um, it, other statistics that came out of the uh, recent PERG uh, publication are that 66% of students, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. 67% of students reported skipping buying the textbook or the access code at all together just because of the cost, even though 90% of them knew that was going to have great implications. Um, and 11% of them reported skipping meals in order to cover the costs of their textbook materials. So obviously, this is a huge concern for the students and something that they pay very close attention to and impacts a lot of their decision making um, in, in their selection of courses as well as in their life. Thanks, Kelly. Um, in the summer of 2000, goodness, 19, I think, yes, it, it, this all seems like it has been 10 years, but it really it hasn't been. Um, Kelly, myself and Candy Morris started working together to um, start to explore alternative textbook options at Ohio University. Um, Ohio University as a university has been uh, putting um, task forces and efforts behind affordable learning content, but the three of our units really came together about a year ago, and this is when we started to dive into what options um, we could sponsor and support at the, at the university. I wanted to quickly mention again from the same surveys as Kelly mentioned earlier, three main points as kind of a segue into talking about what those alternative options are, alternative textbook options are that the three of our units are supporting. Um, the next survey reports that access codes resulted in higher publisher sales. So the publishers um, about four, four or five years ago started implementing a new business model. They started calling it the inclusive access model. This is not new to higher education. A lot of universities have used that model um, before um, without the specific branding of inclusive access. What that really means is students have access to course materials on the first day of class um, at a discounted rate as long as the university or faculty members in this case can guarantee a higher than 90% adoption rate of the material in the course. So it's no surprise that um, with the rise of those models, 
um, the publisher sales are, are on the rise a little bit as well. However, free materials are on the rise as well. 26% of students downloaded at least one free material last year per the survey, per the next survey. Um, that's significant because as we have seen in the March timeframe with um, COVID-19 and the move to remote education, those students who had their course materials listed in the LMS or had that digitally available either through the library or other uh, free links, um, didn't have to worry about getting their textbooks shipped to them or getting um, a version of the course materials um, that they left in their dorm rooms. Um, a lot of the uh, publishers and ebook companies came out at that time at that time to offer free versions of their ebooks that were not available in the library potentially, um, so students could read those. Um, those offers are going away this summer because there's, it's no longer an urgency of quickly switching to remote education. So it is ever so important that we continue to explore online materials, links to library resources in the LMS. Um, but that is on the rise. 55% of students reported they do have access to materials in the LMS. Now, these are not Ohio University numbers, but um, they are relevant to our use case as well. With that, Kelly, if you could move to the next slide, please. Oh, and you're muted, Kelly. Sorry. <laughs> the focus today is that uh, SD and I are going to review our three uh, alternatives to the traditional uh, commercial textbook model. Um, and the reason we're focusing on these three today are primarily because we have access, you have access to them in your classrooms, um, but also because each one of these options allows for students to have access to the course material content on the first day of class. So I, it seems rather um, intuitive and common sense, but there is a growing body of research that shows that students who have access to their course material content on day one of the class have better student success metrics. Their grades are better and uh, their DFW rates are lower. Uh, and that makes common sense, but um, coupled with the idea that students often delay their purchasing or their act or share access to content, uh, these are options that you can use to make sure that your students have their course materials um, throughout the entire semester. So here are some definitions. Uh, open educational resources are teaching, learning, and research resources that are free of cost and access barriers, um, and which also carry legal permissions for open use. And these include open textbooks. So they're free of cost to the students. They're not free of cost to create, but they're free of cost for the user to the students. Um, open educational resources is a term that's used kind of big picture and often includes open learning objects, syllabi, assignments, lecture slides, uh, and so open textbooks are just a portion of the larger idea of open educational resources. And then licensed library content, it's pretty straightforward. This is uh, digital content that the library pays for. Um, so usually university affiliates uh, have access at all times that they're affiliated with the university to this content. Often this content is subscription based. Sometimes it's purchased outright by the libraries, but often it's subscription based, which is a slight nuance in terms of copyright and license contract law as to what you're allowed to use and when you're allowed to use it. Um, and then the final uh, group of materials that we'll talk about today is inclusive access, which SC just mentioned a little bit about on our campus. We call it the Digital Course Materials Program. And this is commercial digital textbooks uh, for which our institution or a group of institutions have negotiated deep discounts. Uh, and these are offered up in a student opt out model as Essie was sort of explaining previously. That allows the publishers to um, have some assurance of large adoption and a large number of students, uh, while still allowing us to offer the students deep discounts on, on their retail prices. Okay, so the advantages and disadvantages of OER and open textbooks. Um, advantages, 
pretty obvious, right? They're free to the student. Um, they're customizable, so you can pick and choose what parts of them you want to use if they have certain kinds of license or copyright uh, attachments to them. You can even change them and uh, adopt adapt them to what your needs are in the classroom. They are digital. Uh, their availability is increasing rapidly. Uh, the Open Textbook Library has over 700 titles now, and they have pretty restrictive uh, requirements and criteria for inclusion in their library, so they are even a, a small set of what is out there. Um, of course, disadvantages is they can be hard to find. There's no ultimate uh, mega Google catalog of all of the OER. Um, they can be limited in number, especially as you get into very niche classes, upper level courses, it's you might not find uh, a, an OER that meets your criteria. Uh, I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks for a lot of instructors is the fact that they often don't come. They're, increasingly, they are coming. These are being made open too, but they typically uh, don't come with the ancillaries. So you need a slide deck, you need test bank, you need these other things. They're not uh, created and attached to the open textbook itself. Um, so and you may need to customize or create your own supplemental supplement materials. And we have a comment in the chat, Kelly. Yeah. OK, Mike, uh, Mike has concerns that the OER materials are out of date, at least in dynamic fields. Well, I think that's always a concern, right, even for a textbook even for a commercial textbook, that um, the editions need to be produced faster and faster. The thing with OER that one could say is an advantage is that often they're licensed with the ability for anyone to change, right? So if it has a license attached to it that says all you have to do is attribute to the original author, then the next person who uses it could update it and offer it back to the world with the updated version. So there is some argument there that perhaps OER may be more flexible in terms of being able to be updated in a more quick manner uh, than the commercial textbooks. Arguably though, like all OER, there it, it, the um, production of those is funded in different ways and with a different model, and that's really where the crux of the matter lies on to whether or not something's going to get updated. Okay, uh, licensed library content, also pretty obvious. The advantage is there. Uh, it's already been purchased by the institution, so it's free to the student. Um, librarians are pretty uh, savvy at using it, <laughs> finding it, uh, and helping you incorporate it into your classroom. So there's a lot of robust help available. Uh, licensed library content is always digital. Um, and by multiple formats, uh, I mean there's movies, there's maps, there's data, there's articles and books um, about any type of information resource you can imagine the library is purchasing. Um, wide access options, and by that I mean students can access the content through whatever mechanism you send them information, whether it's inside of Blackboard or a link on your syllabus or whatever tools you use to interact with your class. Um, and at our institution, we also have an integration tool inside of Blackboard. So if you are a Blackboard user, you can search for and create reading lists right inside of the Blackboard course shell for your students. Disadvantages, right? It can be difficult to find as all uh, uh, pay for information is, but you do have those librarians to help you. Um, it, it definitely requires more effort in the design of your course because you're not going by chapters in a commercial textbook. Um, you have to cobble together things that make sense for your learning outcomes. Um, you definitely are not going to get ancillaries with that, so you will have to create your own slide decks and your own test banks. Um, and disadvantage, of course, copyright and licensing does apply. It is not open in the way OER is open. So now, at last, we arrived at the publisher content. <laughs> um, the digital course materials program, the inclusive access program, um, kicked off, I think, spring 2018 as a pilot program at that point managed by the Office of Instructional Innovations. And ever since um, spring of 2018, it has grown quite significantly. At this point, um, for fall 2020, we have 340 
about 340 course sections who have signed up for an inclusive access model. What this really means, oh, apologies. <coughs> um, the state of Ohio through Ohio Link has negotiated contracts with the major publishing companies, McGraw-Hill, Pearson, Sengage, Sage, Macmillan, um, Wiley and Norton um, for deep discounts for an inclusive access model, which means that um, faculty members who sign up for this model um, will put the link to the course material in their courses. Students can have a chance then to access the materials. If a student doesn't actively, proactively opt out of accessing those materials, they will be billed for that price point. Um, these price points are usually at least 50, 55, 60% cheaper than um, the list price of the course material. Um, so it does save students money. If we do the math that way, arguably it's not necessarily the best way to, to do the savings calculations, but that's how the industry does it. So the industry calculates savings of course material expenses spent in an inclusive access model versus the print physical new list price. If we follow that math, um, we have saved about $3.2 million so far since 2018 um, spring um, for students who are in this model. Again, this means that from a $200 access code, they end up paying maybe $65, um, which is which is a significant saving. The advantages, um, these materials are available for, uh, for students on the first day of class, so as soon as they log into the LMS, they can access the course material. It is lower than list price. All of them are exclusively digital, um, and students can access all of this through Blackboard. Now the disadvantages, they do need internet to access this. For a traditional ebook, um, they can download an ebook reader on their phones, so they can read those ebooks um, when they are not connected to the internet. But about 85% of the adoptions in this program currently is not just an ebook, it's an access code, it's courseware. So it's something that's a bit more enhanced than just an ebook. Those softwares um, typically require internet access from students. And we know from the last spring that that's, that's a concern in many cases. The access codes and the ebooks in general, students cannot resell. Um, I, I honestly haven't followed exactly how popular the book buyback programs have been lately. Um, I know they have been on a decline, but that's just one of those items um, that these are the access codes, especially for courseware expire after the semester once a student is done. I think that's pretty much a, the summary of um, the inclusive access model. Thank you. Now the advantages for digital materials, um, usually, um, when ebooks as a as a product, I would say, first came around, goodness, 10, 15 years ago, it's, it, they, they, they have been around for a while. One of the primary selling points were um, the cost. Uh, many of the companies promoted ebooks, Course Smart, uh, Vital Source, all of the ebook readers that have been merging in and out of the, the industry, that ebooks are at least 50, 55% cheaper than a new print book. Um, one of my comebacks to that uh, previously was that they are still not always cheaper than a used version of the book or going to the library, but but undeniably they are cheaper than a print book. They are usually more accessible. Our partner currently um, is Vital Source for Ohio University, and they are um, one of the premier ebook readers uh, who have spent quite a bit of investment in becoming fully ADA compliant for our students. Um, that goes for um, digital course materials available through the library as well. They can often cheap, be cheaply printed. Uh, print on demand um, books can range for $10, $15 sometimes if that's something that students need. Um, they are often designed responsibly so that they are working on mobile devices equally as well as on a computer screen. That's, that's a good development because that has been a concern for a while. Um, they can be delivered through Blackboard, as Kelly mentioned, that there is a library integration within Blackboard to embed content right away into your course. 
Um, the Vital Source eBook Reader is also available as a tool within Blackboard, so the students can just click on it and find themselves within the eBook um, that they are trying to read. Um, we find that it, I find that those are important steps for students so that they don't have to um, find login information and links to where they need to go when they read course materials. And most of them, of course, allow the highlighting and um, interaction with faculty and um, peers if the faculty member so allows. OK, I am going to send in the chat a link to a document that SDNI put together. And then I'll try to share it on my screen as well. Okay, can you see it on my screen now? Okay. So um, this document is kind of goes through the from a low bandwidth way all the way up to creating your own course materials at the bottom of different things that you can do um, or consider doing in order to uh, help your students with their the costs of their their materials. Um, so, for example, the very uh, first option listed there is to put your complete textbook information in the university's textbook database. So that's the database that integrates with course offerings that students see when they're registering for classes. So, and if you think about how early students register for the next semester's classes, especially if you think about when they register in spring for next fall's classes, uh, this can be a, a big hurdle for instructors to know their textbook materials that early. Uh, but that does allow students to have the full range of options about purchasing. Um, the earlier they know the required textbook, the better chance they have of getting a discounted copy if that's available. Um, and some studies have been done on Amazon's pricing of textbooks. And of course, the pricing of those textbooks rises as you get closer and closer to semester start and more and more students are purchasing the same materials. Um, the next option there is asking you to consider placing a physical copy of your textbook on course reserve in the library. Now, during COVID times, this is not as useful as it typically is because we are probably not going to be sharing a single textbook every two hours with a different student. But typically, uh, this is actually a real, a pretty good way to assure that if you have a student who can't afford the textbook, at least they have access for a few hours at a time whenever the library is open to your assignments, your assigned readings. Um, and, and we can also put other things on reserve as well. We, and we now have a large collection of bone models and huge collection of DVDs um, as well as microscope, microscope slides and other things. Um, another tactic that is actually super valued by students when you are using an expensive commercial textbook that's in multiple editions is to tell them that it's if it's okay to use the previous edition. And if it is okay to use a previous edition, help them figure out how to use the previous edition. So if the page numbers have changed, but the chapter headers are the same, on your syllabus use chapter headers instead of page numbers so they know. Um, the library can also uh, scan and make electronic, electronically available portions of books for you, and we can use our electronic course reserve system, or we can give those to you to put in Blackboard. Um, we already talked about linking to the library's electronic content or choosing a book that the libraries have available electronically. Um, and then here's using OIT's digital course materials program. Um, and includes this includes the current list of publishers that are available through that program and a link to the program on the website. Um, and then the bottom two are about OER, uh, right? Adopt something that has already been created for you to use in class or adapt something or create your own to use in your class. So that's a quick look through our textbook options. And now I will attempt to switch back to the PowerPoint.
Ta-da, I think I did it. <laughs> All right, I will also uh, now send a link to the slide deck for the PowerPoint so that you have access to all the links that we sent in that are in the slides too. And if you have any questions, feel free to speak up or type in the chat and SD, feel free to also add anything I missed or anything you think we should bring up. I think we are open to any questions. It looks like it's taken a minute for that to load. But there we go. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, so these links um, here on the slide that are on the slide deck that I just sent include links to libraries websites so that you can identify the subject librarians, um, information on different services we have that many of which I just ran through in the affordability checklist, uh, as well as a web page that we have to help you learn more about open access and to find OER materials. And in the information technology section is a link to the digital course materials section of their website. And maybe you want to mention uh, Top Hat's relationship to OER. Yes, um, I was just thinking, at, uh, thinking about that too. So Top Hat has a repository of low cost course content um, that is living in the Top Hat reader, so it's fully accessible. Uh, um, most of the times Top Hat has available assessments with these course content options or can embed assessments in these course content options. Um, we have a partnership with Top Hat to leverage their low cost or free if it's an OER content um, course materials and use them in our, our classrooms in addition to their attendance tracking and assessment platform. It's called Top Hat Marketplace, the course material list that they have. And I would say course material prices, they'll range again between three to like 50, $55 per student. I guess I, I mentioned one last thing and then I definitely leave it up for questions. The inclusive access program with publisher content, uh, we the only thing we need from faculty members is um, before the student registrations are starting for a given semester, we would like to know what course material they would like to use with what publisher partner. Um, we will then confirm with the publisher that the content is indeed available in the program. Or usually they all are, except potentially older editions that are not currently available digitally for uh, from the publisher. Um, we then work with our publisher partners to make sure the price points are appropriate and are set up in the system. We set the links in the LMS up for faculty members or they can do so, um, so that the opt out link and the course content access links are available uh, when the students are first coming through the experience. From a student standpoint, they will first have access to the course materials on day one of the course. Um, they will have a chance to decide if they want to opt out of receiving the course material during the add drop period of the course. So that's typically about two weeks for spring and fall semester courses, about a week for summer one and only a few days for summer two. So it just depends on the add drop periods that our that given course has. After the add drop period, if a student opted out of the course content, they will no longer have access to it, so they will have to be. They will have to decide if they want to buy it on their own or or are going to go without. Um, if they did not opt out, um, the bursar's office will be charging their student accounts for the appropriate fees. These fees are available on our website. Um, by federal law, we are required to list every course section and corresponding costs, student costs, and 
the list price of a course material. So those are on the OIT website. I will share it with you. Currently, I think summer is up because that's the running semester. Very soon, fall will be up there as well. So you can take a look at how many sessions are using um, this program and what students are paying in each. Over. Thanks, ST. Let me find it and now send it. Hopefully this link will work. I, I grabbed it from our website. I think it is okay. It looks like it works. Okay. I appreciate everyone's time. Thanks for coming. Oh, here's a couple references to our big surveys. If you'd like to read more, hot off the press. <laughs> Thank you. Please don't don't hesitate to reach out to anyone if you have more questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Esty. Mm -hmm. Bye, Bye, everyone.